One of the things that a lot of Muslims become frustrated with is, and I've met Muslims who've told me that I've been doing dhikr for so long and I don't see any benefits. Ibn Atayla said, had it not been for the opening of God, you wouldn't have been doing any consistent dhikr. That that in itself is an opening from God. If, if, if you're reading the book consistently, that is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was with a Mauritanian recently in, in Mecca, and he said to me that his dua, his father is a, a beautiful scholar and a, somebody who's really does a phenomenal amount of worship. And he said to me that one of the prayers that he supplicates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that God give him the delight of his heart in the prayer. Because he sees his father praying constantly and his father can't live without the extra prayers. Not just the five daily prayers, but the actual extra prayers. He could not live without praying to Hajjud. That for him, it's like breathing. It's like eating. It's part of his life. And that's what he asked me. He told me that that was his prayer to Allah to give him the same delight in prayer that he sees his father achieving in prayer. But his father did not get that overnight. It comes with mujahada because the beginning of the struggle is that one works, but it becomes easier and easier. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easier and easier for you to derive benefit. And this is why if your prayer after 20 years of praying, if you're praying at the same level that you were praying prior to that, something's wrong. Imam al-Junaid, who's called Imam al-Ta'ifatayn, the Imam of the two groups, because he was a, an Imam, a leader in his spiritual understanding, but he was also a leader in the Thawri Madhab. He was a leader in Fiqh and in others. So he was called the Imam of the two groups, the people who were mastering the inward sciences and the people that were mastering the outward sciences. Imam al-Junaid is an Imam by consensus. Imam al-Junaid radiallahu anhu said, Al-Mu'minu yataqallabu fi arba'ina halan fi yawman wahid. The Mu'min's state will change 40 times in a day. Wal-Kafiru yabqa ala halan wahidatin li arba'ina sana. And the disbeliever will stay in the same state for 40 years. Now, one of the things you notice about children, if you have children or have been around children, they're constantly changing. A child will be happy one moment and crying the next moment. The reason for that state is because it, the child is, is always in the moment. He's the child, he or she is in the moment, and the moment is very meaningful to the child. So if, if something happens that, that, that upsets the child, because they're so present in that moment, it manifests quickly in their state. If something makes the child happy, because they're so present, it manifests in their state. But there's people walking around in the world that are somnambulant. They're sleepwalkers. They haven't experienced the joy of the moment. One of the things that the early community used to say is that a Sufi ibn waqtihi, that the Sufi, and this, and this word which is a, a good word, there are people in Imam al-Bukhari's collection that have the laqab of a Sufi, which what the Sufi, the Sufiya, the early people who were the Sufiya, they were considered people who had divorced the world. People who had divorced the world. A group later who imitated them and often were not people of the same upright character, became known as the Mutasawifa. And the early community distinguished between the Sufiya and the Mutasawifa, the people of Tasawwuf and the people pretending to be of the people of Tasawwuf. Most of what people condemn today from amongst the so-called Sufis is actually condemning the Mutasawifa. And it's important that the Muslims should be able to distinguish between these two groups. Mukhtar al buna one of the great scholars and erudite masters of the Islamic tradition in Mauritania said that Qawmun Ashabiha Khairu Isha Fasuyirat min Badihim Maisha Yudaal Ladi Yemshi Aleha Sadiq 
that this qawm, the, the early people, they were called al qawm because of many hadiths that refer to the qawm. Hum al qawm, la yashqa bihim jalisuhum. They are the people that if you sit amongst them, you are not amongst the wretched. Just the fact that you are in their company means that you are amongst the people that are close to God. Even if you're not amongst them, the fact that you're in their presence, you're not one of them, but you're one of them by being with them. Because there's a blessing, al mar'u ma'man ahab. A man is with the one he loves. So if you love somebody close to God, you will be with that person, inshallah, on the day of judgment. And the Sahaba said nothing made them more happy than this statement that a man is with the one he loves. Because they all knew that they had mahabba. If they had anything, if they didn't have anything, they knew they had mahabba of Allah and His Messenger. And so they knew because one of the Sahaba came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, we have the blessing of your company, but in the Akhirah, your maqam is so high. How we won't be with you, we won't be able to be with you. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and said, Al Mar'u Ma'man Ahab, a man is with those he loves. And this brought so much joy to the Sahaba, it brought so much joy into their hearts to know. So the qawm, these people that that are are really their heart is directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See the Ahmad Zarruq. In his extraordinary book called Qawaida Tasawwuf, The Principles of Tasawwuf, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says in, in his book that there are over 2,000 definitions of Tasawwuf, but all of them derive from the essential meaning Sidqa Tawajjuh ilallah, to be truthfully directed to God. And this is, in essence, what our religion is telling us to do to turn to God. To turn to God, to set out on the path to God, to set out on the journey to God. You are on a journey. The Prophet ﷺ said, Safiru tasihu, travel and become well. He also said, Sumu tasihu, fast and become well. The journey of to God will make you well. By merely setting out on that journey, you will feel better. The reason that you're depressed, if any of you are depressed, really. If any of you are depressed, do more for the sake of God. Give more money. Get up in the early morning. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Begin to read the Quran. You will see your thoughts will change. The way you experience the world becomes differently. Wallahi, I can, I can attest to this and I know many Muslims. My wife who's been with me over 20 years now will attest to the changes that she's seen in my life from the way I was 20 years ago to the way I am now, to the way that I react to things. I'm a choleric by nature. There's four temperaments in, in Islam. By me just telling you this is dangerous because you'll know too much about me. But we have four, uh, they're called the uh, akhlaat or the tabaya. There's four temperaments in the Islamic tradition. The Demawi, the Saudawi, the Balgami, and the Safrawi. Some doctors are rolling their heads because they know the Hamdar uh, Institute in Pakistan where they give the Kushta to treat people and things like that. But don't make fun of things you don't know about. The Imam Ali, he said that Man jahila shayan adahu, whoever is ignorant of a thing will condemn it and attack it. This system has been around for a long time and there are hadiths that indicate that the Prophet not only understood it but actually practiced it in his diet. And this is something that is said in the uh, Imam al-Bajuri's commentary on the uh, Shama'id of Imam al-Tirmidhi when the Prophet ﷺ used to eat dates and cucumber together and said, This cools off the heat of this because Dates are hot and dry, and cucumbers are cold and wet, and they create a perfect balance. The egg is a perfect food because the yolk is hot and dry, and the white is cold and wet. This is a science. There are books written on this by great Muslim scholars that go into great detail. The Chinese still practice this in their tradition. But temperament is no justification for bad behavior or bad manners. And unfortunately, in my own life, there are many times that I regret because I allowed my temperament to overcome my control of it and, and then I suffered the consequences of it. 
but because I, I feel bad, at least that I can say that much, that if I got upset at somebody, I feel bad about it. So the choleric temperament, and by the way, John McCain is clearly a choleric person. The choleric temperament is a very dangerous temperament to be in leadership positions because they are very uh, quick to get upset. They do things irrationally when they get upset. When, when, really, Imam Zaid, I'm going to tell you now a little secret about Imam Zaid. Imam Zaid is sanguine, Demawi. Demawi people are the nicest people to be around because they're always positive, they're always happy, they make you feel good about everything. That's why I need Imam Zaid. Like Imam Zaid for me is like an antidote to my choleric nature. I, whenever I, I'm feeling too choleric, I get around Imam Zaid and I start getting that dummy feeling. So it's, it, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing. And then you have the melancholic and the phlegmatic. One of my children is phlegmatic. Knowing that helps me to be patient with him. Really, just knowing that about my child helps me to be patient with him because phlegmatic children are slow. My, one of my boys who's also, uh, he's, he's actually a choleric uh, demawi. He's a sanguine choleric. But he, wh he's always there on the prayer. When I, the other one, the phlegmatic one, he's slow. He catches the second rakat. His, he took too long doing wudu. Really. But it's not, it's not, it's, there's nothing, he's a beautiful boy, but his, it's his nature. So when you understand people's nature, it helps you to be more compassionate with them. It helps you to understand them better. This is, it's apocryphal, but many scholars comment, commentate on it. Some say it's actually from the Jewish tradition, but it's mentioned in many, many books. The one that knows his Lord, uh, the one that knows his self, knows his Lord. If you know your servanthood, if you know your dependence, then you understand the independence of God. If you know your insignificance, you understand the significance of God. If you know your place in the world, then you understand the place that God should have in your heart. That self-knowledge is very important.